So, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, my name is Tatiana Bazzichelli and I'm the director of the Disruption Network Club. And together with me, there is... My name is Lieke Plucher and I'm directing the community program of the Disruption Network Lab. Um, I would like, uh, first of all, to thank our team because uh, uh, it's thanks to them that we were able to do this event. So, I'm going to mention them. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the co-curator of this conference uh, that uh, did the long work with me for uh, 12 months, uh, Mauro Mondello. Uh, then I want to thank uh, Elena Velianoska, Nada Bakker and Monty Harmony that are working on the production. And uh, Jonas Franchi for the design, uh, Steph Lenk for the communication and all the great uh, video streaming team that is here, uh, Rana Vadikari, uh, Hangel and, Rof and um, uh, Gonzalo. <laughs> yeah, they are always free people and I have to remember <laughs> what, where the name belongs. Uh, and Gabriel as well. Um, so I would like to make an applause to all of them uh, because uh, we want to thank the big work that they did to arrive at this point today. And of course, I want to thank the speakers that came. Uh, a lot of them also came taking a plane on their train. And uh, I really want to appreciate this today because, of course, we are not in an easy situation. And uh, to come to a conference now means uh, to take also some risks uh, and uh, at the end also take a trip that takes time. Um, but uh, at the same time, we are also very careful of these risks. So. I want to reassure also all the people that are listening to us on the streaming that we have the room under safety condition with distancing and we are all using masks uh, besides when we speak, otherwise it will be very difficult to understand what we say. Uh, but so thank you very much and I want to say that this really means a lot to us because uh, this is a general consideration. Now culture is also becoming something that uh, is for a few people because we have to keep distance, we have to limit the places. So to make an effort to come to a conference, to be here in presence really means something for us and for all the people that work at this project. So thank you so much, thanks to the audience and everybody that made it here. Um, so just uh, to introduce the topic uh, of this conference and the day, um, I'm happy to say that we are finally at our 20th conference, so it's kind of a big achievement. Uh, I mean, uh, five years ago we started and now we are uh, at the number 20. That is also a special one because of the condition we have to do it. And we are also very happy finally to have something in real life. Uh, but uh, before entering into the topic, I want also to uh, just give some safe uh, recommendation. Uh, we have to use the mask uh, uh, when we are moving in the space. When we are sitting, uh, uh, we can take it off. We have disinfect our hands uh, often and also when we finish the session, we have to leave the room to allow to have enough air coming through. And also please listen to our great production team because they will guide you in and out uh, and always keep the little token that you were given when you enter in the room. So you are assigned to a special uh, number that corresponds to your seat, so keep it because then uh, we remember that uh, you have this chair. Um, but uh, there will be further instruction at the end, I think, because it's easy to forget. But so, let's now enter into this conference. Uh, that is called Data City, um, and we are very happy to uh, speak again on, about these topics. I think it's a, a great line that we uh, trace from uh, uh, last year when we also organized the conference AI Traps. And we want to investigate uh, the cities of the future and also how tracking uh, and surveillance is impacting us all. Um, 
As I say, I curated uh, this conference together with Mauro Mondello. Uh, that, unfortunately, is not here today because, I mean, actually, it's a good uh, thing while he's not here for him because he became uh, a World Fellow at Yale, so he's in the US. But then later we will have also a video that will introduce a bit the perspective that we had together while uh, curating these events. So the first day uh, we will analyze uh, the social and political aspect of algorithm and also the discourse of tracking and surveillance and how we can build up data cities for the benefit uh, of the citizen for all of us. Uh, tomorrow, instead, we will go into the discourse of the smart cities vision for the future and also the implication of new data policies and the impact on human rights. Um, and so, so we will have a second day of this session uh, related uh, on what we can do also to change this situation. Uh, I want now to pass to Lik that uh, she will also explain what happened further and thanks our funders. Yeah, so before getting started, we also want to mention a thanks to all the people who supported and funded our program. So first of all, thanks to the Senat Department for Culture and Europe here in Berlin and to the Bundescentrale for Politische Bildung. Uh, also, we are funded by the Riva and David Logan Foundation and the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. And we are supported in part by a grant from the Foundation Open Society Institute in cooperation with the OSIFA of the Open Society Foundations. And this uh, series that we're doing this year also forms part of the European project Reimagine Europe, which is part of the Creative Europe program of the European Union. And especially for the community program, we're also supported by the Guerrilla Foundation. Um, then for this specific event, we are very happy to also cooperate with the Human Rights Film Festival Berlin. We had a great screening of the film I Human with them last night. And we furthermore collaborate with Transparency International, the Common Action Forum and the Weizenbaum Institute. Um, then we also had a couple of uh, partner events, so we want to thank as well our partner venues. First of all, the space we're at today, the Kunstraum Kreuzberg Betania and the Kunstquartier Betania. Um, then we had some community events at Akut Macht Neu and State Studio, as well as a workshop at Supermarkt Berlin. So many thanks also to them. And finally, thanks to our media partners, TADS, Die Tageszeitung, Experliner and Furtherfield. And a special thanks also to the streaming provided through Boiling Head Media. Um, so after all these things, I would also like to say something briefly about what's happening on Sunday. So this conference, we actually have a three-day event. And we close off with the final day of workshops, which connects the Data Cities Conference with the work of diverse activists and communities that are active here in Berlin and abroad. So this is an extension of the activation meetup program that we're running throughout the year, which I'm directing and running together with Nada Baker. And the focus of this day uh, on Sunday is on sharing skills and tools and strategies on how we can work creatively with data and technology and shape the kind of city that we want to live in in the future. So um, to start this day off, we have an inspirational artist talk by Simon Weckert, especially about his project Google Maps Hacks, which we hope will set a good tone for an inspiring afternoon of workshops. So we have four workshops happening tomorrow. The first one is on Smash Your Filter Bubble, exposing the YouTube tracking system with the project Tracking Exposed. Uh, the second workshop will be visualizing control on critical mapping, and this will be with River Honor, who's also one of the speakers at today's panel. Um, then there's a workshop on reuse, recycle, repair, hacking waste management for the smart city with Felipe Fonseca. And finally, there will be a workshop about developing a citizen manifesto for what we want a data city to look like. And this is by Elisabeth calderon Luning, who will be speaking at the panel tomorrow. And at the end of all these workshops, we will come together to close off collectively and share the experiences and outcomes with each other. So this will be on Sunday. But that is not everything. Because the final event around data cities will be happening actually on the 7th of October. So as part of our meetup program, we organize a final meetup after this conference at State Studio. And this will be about facial recognition data sets. So we invited artist and researcher Adam Harvey. Maybe you remember him. He was also a speaker at our AI Traps conference last year. And he works on the project Megapixels. 
So together with him, we will be exploring facial recognition data sets that are made in cities across the world. And we will hopefully understand more about where this data comes from and also who is using it and for what. So if you want to join, please register online to our website and you can also find all the information there. And then really finally, before we get started, I would like to say something about a little museum that we have here in the space that maybe you've already seen, but it's slightly hidden there in the back corner because it's also all white. It's called the Museum of the Fossilized Internet. And it's a great installation that you can check out uh, during these conference days. Uh, it's a miniature museum that was founded in 2050 to commemorate two decades of a fossil-free internet. So you're invited as a museum visitor to experience what the coal and oil powered internet of 2020 was actually like. So you can go through the different rooms, find out more. There's also a few cards with more information about the project on the cash desk. And this project was created by Gabby Evans with support of Joanna Moll and Michelle Thorne. So, so many thanks to them for having us install the museum here for this, uh, this event. And I just want to add the last thing, uh, uh, to say hello also to the people that are watching on uh, streaming. And uh, important, uh, we have a chat on our website. So the public this time for the very first time in our conferences uh, can interact with us. So please ask questions uh, and then there will be uh, one question or maybe more, let's see, that we will uh, bring uh, to the different uh, conversation today. So please, uh, also if you are watching us on YouTube, go to our website, there is the chat there, uh, on disruptionlab.org slash data cities. And now, before we introduce the keynote uh, with um, Julia Kloiberg, Jaro Mill, uh, moderated by Daniel Irgang, uh, we would like to welcome virtually Mauro Mondello and show his video. Thank you. Hello, I am uh, Mauro Mondello, I am a journalist and I've been uh, co-curating the Data Cities conference with Tatiana Mazzicelli. I am very sorry to not be there with you today. I am uh, in the United States and because of the pandemic uh, it has been very complicated to organize the trip in order to be in Berlin with you today. Anyway, uh, we felt it would have been important to, to uh, Explain a bit how all this uh, this conference started. I I've been uh, I've been uh, working on the subject of cities of future for uh, the last uh, two years. I've been traveling and um, investigating, getting information and data, and uh, with the idea to answer to uh, to a question, which is uh, what uh, the city of the future will look like. I've been talking about this with uh, with Tatiana, and uh, besides the reportage and the documentary that I was planning, we thought it would have been uh, also interesting to organize the conference that we are finally having today. And uh, well, uh, for me, uh, while uh, while uh, traveling and while uh, uh, investigating about the cities of the future, I was. I was uh, quickly realizing that uh, the main point of my research was trying to understand uh, what the architecture will be, what the, the, the daily organization of the city would have been. You know, I had this uh, romantic uh, idea of cities of the future that were like uh, uh, with flying cars and uh, very tall buildings and with uh, strange uh, meats uh, that were going to be to be administrated in very absurd ways but then while i've been uh, i've been visiting cities like forest city in, in malaysia or uh, or uh, nurkent in uh, in kazakhstan i realized that actually the the, the basic point of these cities was uh, the infrastructure that uh, we needed to implement in order to let these cities uh, work for example in, uh, in forest city which is this city in malaysia that actually is uh, is four island uh, that they decided to to build and uh, this is this place is, is a place where they are uh, they are supposing to uh, 
to have every every single uh, thing automatized. I, I want to make uh, um, uh, an example to let you understand what I'm talking about. For example, uh, if you if you will be if you will be uh, living in this city for for ten days for for a holiday, then uh, you will have a, a system, an automatic system, the true artificial intelligence will uh, will be able to to water your plants. For example, or you will never need uh, to to take care of your uh, of your uh, of your rubbish because uh, there will be again somebody that will uh, that will uh, come ex directly to your apartment with the key of the apartment and will take the rubbish and you will communicate just through uh, a system a system that actually uh, pose a very uh, huge challenge and that is I realize that the, the basic challenge of of in the construction of the cities of the future which is uh, that data. Actually, to let these cities of the future work, uh, we have this, uh, this uh, amazing, incredible infrastructure system that need to collect a lot of data, a lot of data about us, and a lot of data about our behavior, a lot of data data about our habits, and this is, of course, uh, making a, a big, uh, a big change in our in our reflections about uh, what the cities of the future will look like because on one side we can say that the cities of the future will uh, improve a lot of issues or situations that need to be improved for example the, the, the mobility or the possibility to create uh, to create clean energy and uh, the, the public transportation all these things are things that could definitely improve in the cities of the future but then we have also other challenges and the basic challenge is the data and the, our privacy and uh, our way to live in uh, these new cities that will uh, quickly become a surveillance city if we don't realize that there is uh, that the, the only way that or basically the way that we are that we are going uh, uh, that, that we are going toward is uh, in the construction of the cities is a way that uh, that uh, forces us to give a lot of data to to the to who is managing the this this uh, new uh, context so coming back to what I was saying at the beginning of this short presentation, uh, I was uh, looking for the answer to the question, what will the cities of the future look like? Uh, I don't think uh, I've been able to find the answer and uh, I don't think uh, neither that we will uh, be able to to find the answer during this conference, but for sure the debate and uh, the reflections that we will will uh, will have during these uh, these days of of discussion here in, at the Data City conference will uh, give us the chance to understand a bit uh, more about the challenges that we will need to face as citizens of these cities and about the way that we need a bit uh, uh, to prepare uh, in order to be uh, rightly engaged in what will be a very very important change in our societies. So uh, I thank again uh, Mauro Mondello for uh, his introduction and now I'm happy uh, to introduce uh, the first keynote of this conference uh, as a title Reclaiming Data Cities fighting for the future we really want. So maybe we cannot find the answer, as Mauro said, but I think we can give really good suggestions. So I would like to call here on stage uh, uh, Jaromil, Dennis Royo, Julia Kloiber, and uh, Daniel Irgang that will moderate them. It's the same. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I really want to thank them for being here. Uh, also, on a, like a personal note, uh, I really want to point out that Jaromil came back here and did uh, a trip of three days for being at this conference with two stops in the night. So, I would say he's a bit the hero for today <laughs> that did this long trip from Pescara. So, <laughs> thank you for being here despite the conditions. And of course, Julia, thank you as well for being here. And Daniel, that is moderating. So, my duty now is to, to introduce Daniel. Then he will do uh, the same with our speakers. 
So Daniel Irgang is part of the research group Inequality and Digital Sovereignty uh, with Berlin University of the Arts. His work uh, focuses on human-computer interaction, media archaeology, art and technology, and epistemology. Uh, he holds a PhD in media studies and uh, is coordinator of the research seminar Critical Zone with Bruno Latour at Karlsruhe University of Arts and Design and the ZKM. So now I leave the floor to you and thank you very much for being with us. for introducing me. I didn't have that long way to come here. Just came from Neukölln, basically, so props to you, Jeremy. Uh, I didn't know that you came by car. That's... Thank you. <laughs> um, it's always fun to have a road trip now and then. Right? Well, yeah. Between a lockdown and Especially now, yeah, I guess. Um, thank you, Tatiana, and um, the organizers for inviting the three of us. And we say a few words um, to the about the panel, I'm, I'm a humanities scholar, so I wrote down a text, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I will try to read that out and make it not too boring. Um, the opening keynotes of this conference have in common a strong plea to recenter or to refocus debates on smart cities. From tropes of technological innovation, business opportunities, and general efficiency of processes towards cities that use data-driven processes to become a space for citizen participation, inclusion of minorities and equality aided by technology. How can we raise awareness of biases amplified by identification and automated decision making and moreover, how can we use technologies to counteract those inequalities? With Julia and Jeremy, we have two actors who work towards the creation of a future potential space where we can reclaim our data cities. Um, as for the structure, we have time um, after both keynotes have concluded um, for questions. So we have to wait after Jeremy and then after Julia's keynote. Um, so uh, don't forget your uh, ideas and questions and responses. Please keep them in mind. Uh, we will first hear uh, Dennis Royo, a.k.a. Uh, Jeremy. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of Jeremy's work, not only since he has widely received posts on medium.com during the lockdown, where he discussed proximity tracing and its socio-technological complexities, and I already mentioned when we talked that this helped me actually a bit to lockdown, reading your posts, not only, but it, it contributed. Um, since many years, Jeremy is a digital social innovation expert, software artisan, and ethical hacker. He is one of the core actors of Dine.org, a think and do tank. A do tank is very important here since you not only advise but create technological solutions and uh, communities around it. Uh, Dine.org operates since 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. This is uh, an unusual resilience for such an independent initiative. So. Impressive. Um, the project Zen Room, Easy crypt Cryptography to the People, is one of Dine.org's projects, and we will hear more about it today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, also, you, sh you, speaking to you now, the uh, audience, you should definitely check out the Algosoft initiative um, hosted by Dine.org. Uh, Algosoft means European Observatory on Algorithmic Sovereignty. Um, sovereignty here uh, relates to the way a community can influence an algorithm. So that's very topical uh, in our perspective here today as well. Uh, and last footnote, I personally hope that, uh, if only in our discussions afterwards, the cultural philosopher Wilhelm Flusser will play a role today. Um, Jeremy, you've received, among other awards and honorable listings, the Wilhelm Flusser Theory Award back in Asian, ancient times in 2009. Um, I led the Wilhelm Flusser archive at Berlin University of the Arts a couple of years ago, so I was glad to hear in a recent talk of yours organized by Axioma that Flusser still does play a role in your thinking. Uh, maybe we'll have time later for some Flusserian thoughts, but first we will have uh, here your thoughts on how we could achieve city, a city where citizens are not governed by algorithms but the algorithms can help us to improve the life of all its inhabitants. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you. 
I'll uh, stand uh, here and uh, yeah, I have some slides to show you. Herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. Ich hau von Berlin. Ich spreche ganz gemischt Niederländisch und Deutsch und Deutsch. It was very much fun to come here. Um, yes. So, yeah, we are um, a bit old, but, uh, you know, being online, there is no age really like we, we were used to times in which there was no gender, no age difference. You were just like a personal nickname in a chat. And that's where Dine comes from. A lot of us from the 94 ham radio amateurs, uh, from experimental people that wanted to work with technology in a community way. So we are a community-based organization. And that makes us, I guess, a think-do tank, although such a category doesn't exist yet in, a, in an institutionalized uh, uh, context. And I guess we resist the challenge of time because uh, more, first and foremost, we are a community-based organization. So we worked only for the past uh, uh, six, seven years on, uh, on behalf of the European Commission on some research projects for uh, addressing both participatory democracy and smart city development. And so what I'm uh, bringing you to your attention is the outcomes are the outcomes and the experiences and the failures of uh, crossing uh, uh, such projects. The biggest one being Decode was led by my colleague Francesca Bria and I was technically coordinator uh, uh, all along uh, the way for uh, its outcomes. So I'm the one to blame if you think we didn't produce anything useful. And um, yeah, it started from this uh, question. Like, uh, yeah, sharing economies, you know, back in 2016 already there was a lot of hype, like, oh my God, the sharing economies are gonna change our life, make it better because collaboration and crowdfunding, um, whatever crowd sourcing, like uh, the wisdom of the crowds. And uh, quickly we saw that uh, right in the city fabric, in uh, the dense settlements in which we live, this sort of approaches also cause problems. This is a random picture that I took in Athens. I was uh, giving a speech a year ago and I was just crossing the city to the venue I was giving a speech and a parade of uh, motorbikes and bicycles passed by and just uh, leafletted this sort of stuff. Very popular position to be against Airbnb right there. Uh, it's also like a protest in uh, Amsterdam. It was a focus for our project Decode to understand how Airbnb uh, wild, uh, uh, unregulated uh, uh, BRB rentals uh, is affecting the, the, the city fabric, the prices of renting and the possibilities of people to live there. So we saw uh, in the last years, I think it's hard to deny it, that uh, uh, all this sort of optimism for an accelerated approach to applying technologies to match our desires and needs uh, is not only leading to good results, it's on, not only an advantage for us. So what do we have to do to reclaim the smart city? Here I'm quoting uh, an incredible work in the policy sector that has been led by, by Francesca, a manifesto that has been signed by the city of Barcelona, Amsterdam, New York, uh, and um, I'm not sure about Berlin, uh, now I, don't, I didn't prepare the list, but many cities. And it is uh, 0.2, it's on GitHub, you can still uh, amend something in this manifesto. What I'm going to show you mostly is about how-tos. Uh, I don't despise the Marxian tradition of manifestos, but I do think that nowadays how-tos are more useful than manifestos. So, before coming to give this keynote, I, I like to use the interwebs uh, for some uh, uh, interaction. And I pose this question on, uh, on one of the most popular social networks where the Pope is also writing and I'm very honored to be able to post sometimes. The question was the one uh, highlighted and uh, the answer were not so many, but some people tried. It's a question that I posed at the end of a previous keynote that I gave in Rotterdam and that I really came out of my mind as something that can actually be a conversation starter for people also talking about AI and about computers and algorithms. 
So think about what you have around you as an algorithm, as an AI. If that serves the purpose of you understanding the world or, and the machine, or the machine to understand you. I think it's, it's rather obvious there is a majority of, uh, of devices, AIs, technologies, algorithms that are there to understand us without sharing that consciousness, without sharing that, that understanding with us. One of the first answers I got was from Mikhail that interestingly enough poses the question immediately about substituting humans with machines. Mikhail gave me the opportunity to actually state that I think this is a wrong uh, point to start from uh, for this debate. And I often have, have, have seen it mostly in uh, transhumanist uh, uh, scenes, in this uh, uh, cryptocurrency accelerated uh, uh, dystopian dream of reality that this is the argument we should be debating about, that machines are substituting humans. I think uh, if we start from here, we, we completely lose the point of the discussion. Uh, also, I believe that this will not happen. The actual um, uh, liability of a human behind a driving wheel, but also the, um, uh, the importance of uh, our open world assumption uh, in, in governance is, uh, is uh, never to be uh, skipped or should never be skipped. So, I quote uh, my friend Konstantin here from Berlin also on this uh, uh, going straight to the point uh, uh, commentary that CAPTCHA is an obvious example. It's more articulated, it's, um, it's a sort of a test that machines have to do on you uh, in order to understand that you are not a machine as well. Because we are interested in extracting human sense, human thought. I'm talking like a machine now. Uh, you know, I really want to know what a human mind knows and produces. Well, CAPTCHAs are an interesting technology. They were developed by a certain phone Han that uh, now works for Google since then. And they were developed initially as games to deconstruct circuits. So there is a certain uh, way to build electronic circuits that can de deconstruct uh, it in little puzzles. And I've, uh, I've commented in the past uh, what would happen if we deconstruct ballistic missiles circuits and make it them as little games for kids in schools to play with and help develop those weapons. There are certain uh, things that we want to know about what we are contributing when we actually produce sense and interaction, I believe. Another and the third uh, last one, commentary, I hope I'm not too long with this like parenthesis of forward interaction, was by Michel and I think he opens up a very interesting uh, reflection that I'd like to share with you. Uh, he uh, basically questions the ranking the ranking dynamics and how much ranking and uh, how much reviews are important for us. And I would like to take this uh, reflection and go a step farther. Because it's not just ranking what we're talking about. It is attention. And thanks, Adam, for the nice conversation we had right after I arrived here in, uh, in uh, Berlin for reminding me of this story of Philip K. Dick, who was one of my favorite writers of our uh, uh, friend Antonio Caronia. Uh, he wrote this book once, and I think uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting story, not because it has been told in, by Total Recall, don't go and watch Schwarzenegger right away, but I think that there is a certain approach uh, in social networks right now in capitalizing on our memories and proposing us these memories back to us. And what is the algorithm that will actually show a memory to us? I pose you another question. How much power I have on you if I can show you a picture of your past at a certain moment in a certain condition? I argue I have the power to condition your next choice. I argue I have the power to distract your attention from one thing to the other. I have an enormous power on your affective status. So, when we get the memories that are proposed to us, um, thrown back at us by a social network, 
What does that happen? And why it is tricky to search through the archive of the memories that we constantly feed in those machines? Why there is not like an easy search? I argue that the next uh, uh, business model of the social networks will be actually selling us our memories. And conspiracy theorists may look very stupid when they say, oh my God, they're going to put a chip in a vaccine and track us. Well, I believe in vaccines, I believe in science and I will vaccinate myself, but there are certain aspects of conspiracy theories that we may want to look back because yes, your phone is right now looking like this meme because tracing has been adopted. It was an interesting experimentation I really liked the first uh, uh, initiative by Carmela Troncoso to actually develop a really privacy-preserving and wonderfully elegant uh, scenario, uh, scheme, cryptographic scheme for tracing. But uh, that was uh, since then and since my post taken up by some governments with a quite an oversized uh, amount of funding and then uh, completely realized by Google and Apple in a framework which is closed source. So, let's be careful because the moment is actually being used to really enforce something that uh, even I wasn't seeing because I'm a fetishist with technology and when I see like, oh my God, we can solve this problem with the technology, I jump on it and perhaps that's my problem, that's my limit. So, I show you my next mistakes or successes as you like. What do we do for fixing this system? I don't know. I am very focused with my colleagues on small components and actually on interventions that can uh, empower people. So one thing that I really wanted for, uh, for uh, the Dine Foundation since uh, its inception is that we don't go for domination, we go for empowerment. And this is something that I, we inherit from certain social and political movements. We have still a lot to learn from. So, the approach is that of building, um, in this case, an uh, operating system, which is a parallel a fork of Debian, a way more known and big operating system that had a political process in place uh, back in 2014 that made it deviate from the simplicity and variety of uh, a thousand scripts from the Unix tradition, some of them sedimented in the last 20 years, it made the, the system switch to a new system, completely coded from ground up and uh, funded by a multinational corporation, Red Hat. Um, of course, uh, big corporations of open source now exist, so we, open source is no more a niche. We are actually dealing with a corporate presence within the open source communities. Red Hat was bought by IBM, one of the biggest acquisitions uh, we have seen in the last years. And uh, Red Hat developed System D, a system that uh, actually overrides all these scripts that people have written in many languages, in many ways, and uh, make them a uh, registry, a thing you can choose, like do this or do that, but you don't see how it's done. So I would like to put forward very much this concept. Uh, one thing is knowing the data and one thing is knowing how this data is being treated and presented to us. And this is a key point to understand what algorithms are for us. Algorithms, in most cases, are procedures that treat data and we don't see them. Now, if we debate that, um, if we are to debate like it happened in the US, that uh, the cameras for surveillance are biased based on the, data, uh, on the data that is fed to them. As it happened in the court cases in the US that debated that there was a bias, a racial bias, in, in the, uh, a racist, I should say, bias, in the way uh, Arai, the, the, the police, uh, this new uh, generation of police software was used. In those court cases, it was never analyzed the code that was used. And uh, I think that the code, the algorithms, the procedures are a very important thing to open up and debate and have a literate debate about them. Because it's not only a database 
and you cannot just get out by saying, well, the population was of this sort of uh, uh, cultural background, ethnical background, even before we adopted these machines. So now we have samples that are bigger and it's just like happening as it was. No, these machines have a procedure and you're not showing it because it's protected by a secret, a trade secret. So procedures and, and data are very important. And what I am focusing with this project and with a community that is now uh, has gained traction is the procedures. So to open up the procedures and especially to make them a community process. So I give you another hint about where I want to get with this keynote. As Francesca also says, the smart city of the future is a city that is governed by its own citizens. It's a city that offers participation to its governance. It's not a city that just gives them top down up a network of sensors, grab their data and, uh, and use it for reasons they cannot even understand. So back to an operating system, a GNU Linux nerd system. The, the fact that we wanted to preserve the whole system as it was generated an incredible event that now runs for about, um, well, 2014, so we have six years old. Uh, we have a team of people that has uh, another dimension of diversity that I really like and enjoy, that of uh, age. So we have uh, elderly people stepping into the, the process of doing the system and telling us how it was done 20 years ago and how they could still manage it afterwards. We have uh, a sort of uh, um, interaction towards themes of innovation that I find very, uh, very healthy. So it's not perhaps disruption. So this is against one of the names <laughs> of, of this organization. Perhaps uh, you, can, uh, you can rethink or uh, re-elaborate. This is not disruptive innovation. But yes, it is disrupting the culture of innovation. And I think we are a minority nowadays where disruption was, was, a, uh, was a minority, was a novel thing back perhaps 10, 20 years ago. Now to say disrupting the, the innovative rhetoric of the industry is the, real, uh, is the real action, is the real minority action. Definitely we are a minority compared to the community of Debian. Definitely we don't have the same funds, but that one will continue uh, actually with a lot of uh, uh, participation. And it's incredible, it's an incredible human sphere because we finally don't have these like very aggressive 20 years old nerds that you find everywhere. We have people that have lived a, a life working with computers and have an approach that is way more human in between each other. Yeah, the GNU Linux sphere can be sometimes very, very uh, nasty. One thing we also put forward out of this experience, and I'm a big advocate of this, is minimalism in software design. And I think minimalism uh, doesn't speak only to software design, but also to security. I'm not here to talk about security, but just think how much more secure is a system that is simple, not complex, and therefore can be understood by more people. And therefore you can have more people actually spotting the weaknesses in the system. So I invite you to look up for minimalism in software design on uh, um, the YouTube uh, uh, platform where it's hosted this. Uh, there, is a, there is a lecture by Katolatz, a member of our community. And uh, it's a fantastic uh, talk of one hour about this. The other, the second and last project that I present to you, how much time do I have? It's, uh, it's good, oh. Yeah. The second and last project that uh, Daniel mentioned is Zenrom, and this is a more recent approach, and actually the main outcome of the Decode project in terms of technical output uh, for us at Dyn and within the whole project. It's a component that has been used through all the implementations that we have made, both in the city of Amsterdam and Barcelona, and it is also a small component, so this is not a product, this is not the whole car, this is a small thing, yeah, well, the whole bike, <laughs> I prefer that, and uh, it's just a whole thing, it's like a very particular chain. And the motto, yes, is cryptography for the people. 
because we would like people to be able to understand how data is processed, to understand it and to change it and to tailor it for their needs. So it's a secure virtual machine in the sense of Java, uh, JVM, so it runs on pretty much every hardware we ported it to, including WebAssembly and including small ESP32 chips. So it runs unikernel, it runs as a standalone. It, uh, it's a one megabyte big. It's, uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of it, I must say it's the third bigger project that I've write in my life and it's, uh, it's a clockwork. It runs in two megabytes of RAM. Two megabytes, not two gigabytes. And it uh, implements a direct syntax parser in Lua, which is a domain-specific language. Um, in short, it's a very uh, human-like language, whose example you can see here, and describes a series of operations that, in this case, Alice can do in Wonderland. Oh, this is Alice and Bob, so the typical cryptographic example. What can do Alex to Alice to um, send an encrypted message with a public-private key scheme? So the diffie Elman uh, PGP uh, sort of thing some of us are used. And this, what you see, is actual code. So the virtual machine that can be embedded inside other devices, uh, mobile phone, some Bitcoin people put it in the Trezor uh, wallet. It, it's, it's actual code that executes operations on data, on uh, JSON structure, on data structures. So you can play around with this. Uh, there is also a website you can uh, visit. Uh, we are about to launch it. It's a beta. It's a API room, API room .net. And you can already see examples that you can change and stuff you can code to play around with data. Why that? Because I think that uh, it's our, um, you know, back then when I, when I, when I hang out with a lot of cypherpunks uh, uh, and, and we discuss about the, the, what to do for this, uh, you know, uh, world uh, uh, crisis and if hackers can save the world, one thing I always thought is that we are the 1%. We are hating as hackers, we are an elite and we are just enforcing a technocracy that often oppresses people. And yeah, we can make programming as cool as we want, we can teach it in the schools, but that's not the only quality that we need to actually make the world a better place. So I believe that actually making people more in charge of what is running on their computer is very important. What we did with this, uh, one example, we, we did the various pilots uh, in Amsterdam and Berlin. And uh, well, this was the one that we did with the city of Amsterdam. We had a lot of fun working with a team uh, within the municipality. Uh, the team developed an open source passport reader. Uh, believe it or not, this costed uh, 50 euros. Now ask your own government how much they spend in procurements to Diebold and other companies for passport readers uh, that are basically, you know, feeding the military industrial complex. So this was built in, uh, uh, with a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's uh, reading what's the content of the passport. It, uh, it, through the process, we learn a lot how passport works and it's very interesting. I invite everyone to look into it. And uh, it gives you a credential. So the person in front of you that sees, uh, sees your passport can actually uh, give you a credential. And we wanted to enforce the scheme to actually delete the concept of identity. So the passport goes beyond and you ask for a credential which is an attribute and the attribute is I am above 18 years old. So if the person that verifies your passport does that, then you are released a QR code. This QR code will say that you are 18 years old without you showing any information about yourself. It's called zero knowledge proof. And it's also untraceable because every time you show it, it will be different. So if someone records every time you show this QR code, they will never get to the same person. They cannot follow you. And we put this system inside the Paradiso, a big club in Amsterdam, so that kids could buy beer without showing their ID and name. And I think that's a great pilot because, you know, yeah, beer is good. So, did I convince you you have any questions? I think you should be very skeptical about anyone presenting you with tech as a solution nowadays. 
and I appreciate your criticism. Just uh, let's let's talk more about what what this will lead. I haven't presented you a solution. Uh, I think uh, uh, these are paths, and uh, you know we we learn uh, doing them together. So I think starting from a community of uh, of uh, and and learning together is the main thing. And relearning urbanism perhaps is the best thing that we can do as uh, smart city practitioners, if we are to keep the term. Thank you. Here is where you can follow a bit more. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jeremy. I, I wrote down in preparation some questions, uh, especially about Zen Room, which you now answered already, so I can throw them out of the window, but that's good. Um, let me introduce before, again, before we ask more questions to Jeremy, let me introduce Julia first, and then we hear your keynote. Um, Julia, as you know, we've met before at uh, Super Lab, uh, which you have founded, as many of you know. Um, at the exhibition of student projects uh, developed in one of our seminars by Nushin Yastani and Yasmin Krim. The seminar was centered around the question how to design digital futures of participation and equality. So I believe this nicely connects to the topics we will hear from you today and why we are here in general. Um, I know that the students um, had a great time at Superlab and it is indeed a wonderful initiative. So every one of you uh, who is not aware of the lab's projects on building inclusive and sustainable ways of living together, using a term by Latour, um, you should either check the domains, uh, the website SuperNet, so these are three R's, SuperNet, um, or say hello when you are at Moritzplatz, I believe. Um, Julia, you develop strategies and concepts to help shaping sustainable, in an ecological and social sense of the word, digital futures. You collaborated with the Mozilla Foundation, the Open Knowledge Foundation, and the Engine Room, and you launched various projects on open data and civic tech, such as the Stadtland Code and Apps and the City. To help out other thinkers and doers to develop digital sustainable projects, you co-founded in 2016, uh, the Prototype Fund, Germany's first public fund for open source software projects, uh, which by now supported quite many projects. Um, do you know? 150, uh, 140. Well, and you just told me that um, it's funded for another four years, so congratulations. Uh, in your talk today, you will ask about the conditions or fundamentals to reclaim the digital data cities before the implementation of technological takes. Uh, of technology takes place or takes over, so to speak. Uh, Julia, please. Thank you. The following conversation on Twitter pretty much inspired me for the focus of this talk. Because while it's very tempting to speak about emerging tech, about the utopias or dystopias that might be ahead of us, Today I want to take some time to talk about the fundamentals. The fundamentals that are important when it comes to reclaiming cities and or data cities and working towards just and equal futures. I'm going to talk about governance, about equity and openness. For my first example, I want to take you to Canada, to Toronto, to 12 acres of land near the waterfront. This is where Sidewalk Labs, a sister company of Google, was planning a smart city neighborhood. So basically, big tech moving into the city space, into the civic space. For all of those of you who don't know Sidewalk Labs, a little bit of context. Sidewalk Labs is headquartered in New York and one of their flagship projects there was the Link New York City project where they would replace public phone booths with Wi-Fi hotspots. So the hotspots would give you access to the internet but they would also collect and store your browsing history. But back to Toronto. In 2017, Sidewalk Labs started with its plans for a smart city neighborhood, a neighborhood built from the internet up. 
the rhetoric they used was a rhetoric around the city as an operating system and they and their partner Waterfront Toronto, uh, a real estate development agency in Toronto, would be the ones who would develop these operating systems that others could then tap into. This is a rendering of what they were planning. Autonomous vehicles, underground garbage, robots, green energy infrastructure, snow melting sidewalks, you name it. And as a smart city project, sidewalks would also collect and use data to manage and define how the neighborhood worked. I was there for their launch event in 2018 in Toronto. I arrived right after the First Nation people ceremony had wrapped up, so the, the ceremony that would acknowledge on which land this smart city or this experiment was going to be built, so everything was very politically correct set up. It was fully booked, people were very interested, asked a lot of questions, left a lot of feedback notes. You could leave feedback notes in front of every project, very one directional process, but still. Um, and Sidewalk Labs and their partner, Waterfront Toronto, they were ticking a lot of boxes. They were talking about affordable housing, sustainability, and participation of the public. Topics that, would be, that you would usually hear elected officials talk about, not so much companies. But there was one thing they did not address and they did not talk a, a lot about in the beginning. And that thing was governance and data ownership. This was something they wanted to figure out on the fly while they were developing this project. A common tech for good trap is to talk a lot about the what. What technology, what the future will look like with this technology, but to talk very little about the how about the not so sexy things, the governance structures, the intellectual property, and privacy. Many things related to the digital governance of public infrastructure are currently legal by default, not because they should be, but because cities are just not keeping up with the pace of the tech industry. Or sometimes these legislations are even being co-written by um, lobbying of these organizations. This was also the case for Toronto. So 10 months into the project, two contracts were signed, but the question, who owns the data, was not answered. Activists and civil society organizations were very worried about that because data monopolies like Google have done little to reassure the public that they can be trusted without strong regulatory oversight. And data is such an important infrastructure for the city. Just think about policies the cities are working on. You need a lot of data in order to inform these policies. So this is when Block Sidewalk was born, an initiative by activists to educate the public on what was going on to demand transparency and to report on the development of the project. They built community capacity around digital rights and reported on the la latest developments. And after many months and even years, 2000, uh, 2017 to 2020, after many years of organizing, of sending open letters, of protesting, Block Sidewalk was eventually successful. In May, the company announced it was abandoning the project. They cited economic infeasibility due to COVID-19. But what wasn't mentioned was that the project had become politically infeasible. I've cut the example short for this talk. I recommend you going back to the whole history of the thing. There was more in transparency and backroom deals involved in all of that, but the lack of regulation on data governance was something that was flawed right from the beginning, something that had led to a major loss of public trust. I don't want to leave us with this flawed example, that's why I added a different example, something that a lot of people here in Germany can maybe relate to, the Corona app. Remember the long discussions about, are we gonna do the decentralized or the centralized approach? Are we gonna open source this whole thing? And even though it cost precious time to discuss privacy and data in all its aspects, I would argue that it paid off. 
because it increased the acceptance of the public. I'm not saying this was a straightforward process that was well planned, but it was fascinating to see how quick civil society organizations, researchers and others organized in order to push for the decentralized approach while educating the public about the benefits of it. And in the end, millions installed the app. So prioritizing people's privacy and transparency was fundamental for trust. Let me take you from Canada to Sweden, to a city called Karlskoga. Swedish winters are cold, as many of you know. You can get snow up to here. And during winter, cities are in constant snow removal, removal mode. First, they are clearing the big streets, then they are clearing the smaller streets, and as a last thing, they are clearing the walkways. This was also how the city of Karlskoga used to do it, until they found out that their snow plowing schedule is disadvantaging women. This revelation came through a gender equality program. So the city had to go through all of their public policies, city planning policies, to see if both men and women benefited equally from them. They did not, because mobility patterns of men and women are different. Women are much more likely to use public transportation and to walk. Just to give you some numbers, in France, two-thirds of the passengers of public transportation are women. In cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, and Vienna, over 60% of the people who use public transportation are women. Women do more unpaid care work, and therefore they have more complex movement patterns. So going from a U-Bahn station to a school, to grocery shopping, and back to the U-Bahn station, for example. In contrast to women, men are more likely to use cars, according to the data. And even in Sweden, you can see that in the data, even though you might uh, think that Sweden is a very kind of feminist country compared to others. So women were the ones who got stuck in the snow on the walkways, having to walk through snow, having to push strollers through snow, or riding a wheelchair is way more dangerous and exhausting than driving a car through a little bit of snow. So when the city of Karlskoga found out how their snow plowing schedule was disadvantaging women, they changed it and started to prioritize walkways. You can see that in a bunch of cities in Sweden by now. And this change did not only lead to more gender equality, but the public ultimately also saved money because there were less injuries, less people falling on the walkways. So what can we learn from this Swedish example that gathering data and having figured out data ownership is one thing, but only until you look for the gaps and the bias in the data, you can get a better understanding of whom you're disadvantaging and whom you're leaving out when you're planning cities. And I'm not only talking about binary gender equity, I'm talking about social equity, environmental equity, racial equity, and all of its intersections. This is a very complex issue. While doing research for this talk, I learned that gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting is not, nothing new to cities at all. Cities like Vienna, Copenhagen, and Berlin have been working on projects and pilots for a very long time. There's a resolution from 2002 from the Berlin Senate for gender mainstreaming. And I really recommend also reading a handbook that came out in 2011. But then there's no mention of all of these approaches in the smart city strategies. If you look at the smart city strategy from Berlin from 2015, it's 45 pages thick. It mentions efficiency 26 times, the word economy 18 times, and the word equality once. So centering our smart cities around equity, care, maintenance, and inclusion I believe, would not only help us to discover structural inequalities, but it would also help us to evaluate which technologies are beneficial for society and which are sheer useless or harmful. Because as we heard before, technology is something that is prone to deepening social divides in our cities. If we're aiming for just futures, then equity has to be on the first page of our smart city strategies. Let's end with one of the most fundamental topics, 
openness. It's a good basis for all the other um, topics. From Toronto to Karlskoga to Berlin, Berlin was the city where I first got in touch with the data cities topic, or more precisely, the topic of transport data. In 2008, the iPhone came out, and I don't know, maybe some of you remember, also the first iPhone app for public transportation in Berlin was released by a student from Potsdam. He was scraping the data from the BBC website and was accessing the, the maps from the internet. So his app was the first tool that Berliners could use on their phones to navigate the cities. And that is way before um, Google Maps or Apple Maps or um, other map services had the transport data. So he built this tool and he had thousands of users within days, but then the BBC, the transport agency of Berlin, threatened to sue him for copyright reasons because maps like these are under copyright. They didn't understand what he was doing and why this data that belonged to them should belong to the public and to people who wanted to navigate the city and the, um, the work that the public transport agency should be doing is transporting people from A to B. So that was back in 2008. In 2012, I led the effort to open up Berlin's public transport data. So even though that happened in 2008, in 2012, people were not yet convinced, or the, the agencies were not yet convinced, that the data they collected and owned should be open to the public, which sounds quite odd now in 2020. The whole open data topic, as some of you might know, and also the open source topic, uh, took forever to gain traction here in Germany. And while governments are now keen to be on top of the open data charters and promote open source, I want to argue that they are not embracing the full concept behind openness. Because openness is not a means to an end. Open data is not about throwing data on a data portal, but it is a starting point for collaboration and participation, for opening up processes for others so that they can join and for meaningful exchange. Let me show you an example of how narrow the understanding of openness can be. This is a document. This is the contract, the Corona app contract between the, the Federal Ministry of Health and SAP, the company who built the Corona app. And even though the Corona app is open source, the paragraph in the contract that talks about rights on intellectual property and open source is not. So it's blacked out. This is almost satire. And um, maybe just to, to briefly mention this, this is from the website of a Freedom of Information portal. And you can buy this as an art edition to, to support their work uh, for those of you who are interested. So there's still a long way to go when it comes to openness. And while this example was an example from the federal government, I want to leave you with something that gives me hope for openness in the smart city context when it comes to Berlin. The city lab, the innovation lab of the city of Berlin at the airport Tempelhof just received a grant from the federal government to develop Berlin's smart city strategy further. And the engagement with civil society organizations is at the core of this plan. The proposal talks about how to shift the focus from talking about services, infrastructure, the economy, towards talking about public, um, public participation, transparency, and more cooperation. They are talking about the what, but more importantly, they have a very clear strategy for the how. If I can leave you with two things for the next three days of this conference, then those would be the following. Talk about developments and technology, but keep going back to the fundamentals and consider what role governance, equity, and openness play in your project. Because those elements will be fundamental for working towards futures we want to see. And then I'm actually kind of ending similar as Charamil, because even if we're building the most responsible, open, and trustworthy tech, it's always important to keep in mind that technology can only be part of the solution.
Thank you, uh, Julia. Um, I think I start with a question uh, directed to you, but feel free, Jeremy, to, to turn into this whole topic I'm raising now. Um, I admire your plea against, uh, against techno-solutionism in a way, um, because you bring forward rather to focus on how, what to do technology and how to implement the, as you call it, the fundamentals of trust, equality and openness. Um, at the same time, you mentioned the Sidewalk, Toronto, Sidewalk Lab Toronto example um, and its failures. Are, especially talking about smart cities, are failures like this necessary to, to spark this debate? Because in smart cities, discourses, the usually invisible subliminal governance of algorithms and data become very tangible because they intervene in the life worlds and literally in the neighborhood of citizens and become a discursive object, so to speak. It's, it's a costly failure <laughs> on tax money, but do you think it's necessary to... For open data, I would always argue that um, disasters or crisis is necessary for governments to move on a bit quicker. Like in, 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 in the UK, you had the expense scandal before Cameron would, um, would focus on open data. And in other places, you would always see this crisis. So for open data, I would argue for the smart cities, I'm not sure. I mean, Barcelona and you might be more familiar with the, with the context there. Um, was there a crisis involved in like starting the whole, oh, okay, so see there's, uh, so there seems to be a pattern of crisis to like get this emergency and to get um, governments to act a little quicker on things that civil society has been promoting and telling them over the course of years. And oftentimes it's also like bringing examples from abroad so you can preach for a long time if you're a local, a local civil society organization, but as soon as you have this great example from abroad that caught like a lot of media attention, then things are eventually moving quicker. But now I'm curious to hear the Barcelona uh, crisis situation. Yeah, it's, um, well, you know, the, the, the current, um, I mean, uh, Francesca served also as, uh, in, in the municipality together with Ada Colau as an as a alcadessa. And uh, this sort of government is generated by the crisis that was uh, uh, the, the Quinto de Mayo. No? It was a democratic movement, a democratic crisis. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I would say. Um, I think it, it's also interesting to see that Ada Colau was one of the most prominent activists for the uh, housing rights. And I think it makes a lot of sense for a city to recognize its shortcomings, uh, for a city like Barcelona or Amsterdam, like extremely touristical cities, um, to, to recognize that as, as, uh, as an emergency to be tackled. And when you talk about crisis, I come to think like uh, the, of the term kairos, no? which in philosophy is like the rapture, that uh, is always a moment of opportunity. And as, uh, as uh, Negri and Hart in, in, indicated it as, as an opportunity for the movements, I think one of the um, things that we have to keep in mind is that the crisis is also an opportunity for uh, the industrial apparatus to take over. Um, just going to this concept of ruptures. Because I'm a, you know, I, I've been always a big fan of um, uh, Brecht, uh, that um, uh, he coined a term called Umfunktionierung that was uh, quoted by Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin, several times in describing the opportunity that theater has to advance its, uh, its um, expression of a socialist ideal, in case of uh, Brecht uh, statements, by using every single technological advance. So I would like to bring the, the, the discussion further and ask whether a technological advance can also represent a crisis. And if that crisis is a sort of negative crisis that allows certain other forces to step in. Because unfortunately it's not like uh, Brecht uh, has uh, seen it in the first place. Or at least Brecht was interpreting a dynamic in theater, <laughs> but not in reality. Yeah, and then also the moments of like 
that civil society starts to organize. The, I think the Corona app was also kind of a moment where a lot of organizations started to team up with scientists and like people and organizations around them to push for a common cause and a common goal. And I think it was similar in Toronto that 30 organizations teamed up and started this block sidewalk initiative and um, all of a sudden had to react. But what, what is really important to keep in mind that these infrastructures have to be in place. These civil society organizations have to exist in order to being able to team up and to fight certain things. And I think this is something that we forget when we're in periods of like, I mean, you can't say no crisis these days anyways, but when we're in periods of when not a lot of shit is hitting the fan at the same time, um, that it's important to support civil society infrastructure and organizations that drive change from the bottom up. I, I don't know where to, where to connect now because uh, both of you said very wonderful things. I would like the, the energy of the crisis or the catalysator of crisis, I would like to come back to that in a minute, but first I need to make a detour back to, of course, Bertolt Brecht because it was very interesting that you mentioned him and actually Besides the Umfunktionieren and the epic theater concepts, he also is famous for his, as some of you probably know, of his radio theory, which wasn't really a Korean theory, but uh, the plea to the people, the listeners of the radio back then, the, the mass media, the electric mass media, um, to use them to also send, to build, um, to hack this, this radios in a way and to... to, to make them speak and not only receive. And there were a lot of hobby groups at the time, they were shut down by the Nazis later, who actually had the means to build transmitters with a short range, but in the city of Berlin there were quite a lot of worker movements, um, uh, radio worker movements in this way. Um, so long story short, and also connecting to Barcelona again, you said in your talk, um, because um, you know, you have this Barcelona Data Ownership Manifesto by Francesca Bria and you said that you would like to replace Manifesto with how-tos and you would also like to uh, um, uh, replace disruption with empowering. Um, so do you think this, uh, could you elaborate on this idea? Because I think this, this both these replacements could be like a, a theme for the whole conference in a way. Well, I think that uh, uh, I don't want necessarily to replace Francesca's manifesto. I think it's a great thing that she had it signed and written. And uh, But um, it is, there is a certain urgency, and I see also as drifting words, the words of policy and the word of practice and grassroots practice. And while uh, uh, Julia is pointing clearly at a very simple to apply solution in many situations of crisis, this is not adopted by policymakers or it's not adopted fully, it's not like open source. Yeah, we will run this open source platform, but you don't actually understand what it means to run a participatory democracy process. And uh, Barcelona has many good examples. I think there, uh, Decidim is making a difference. Um, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, experiment because, first of all, because the developers are eating their own dog food, so there is a meta decidim to decide about the changes in the software, which already shows you how much important people really recognize into actual algorithms. And I, and I argue here that every regime of algorithms in which people are participating, the participant should be part of the process of governance. The same way we are allowed to vote for a lawmaking process. And, um, and then the CDM itself is not just a platform or a software, which is pretty plain and simple and nice. Uh, under the software we put uh, cryptographic uh, security um, measures to actually not affect the, the petition signment, signing. But it's not just that. It's not just a page without advertisement, although that is pleasant. It's not a well typographed website. Is um, is it's a it's a human process. They call assemblies. They discuss in person. They use the platform as one, they use the tech as one of the elements that can actually inform people when they take decisions. And here we are back to the cyborg. I mean, uh, we can and we should engage uh, the hybridation uh, that uh, cybernetics uh, put, uh, put forward for us, but we should keep in mind that um, 
there is a human part to it and that we are not just feeding an, in, an artificial intelligence to give us back the answers, but we have to get a process in place. And this process is uh, sometimes dirty, is sometimes painful, sometimes it's a lot more work than putting up a, a web server. And, uh, but that means really making uh, a participatory democracy platform or uh, for what is worth uh, a smart city, I believe. Yeah, making policymakers aware of that, I mean, you know, that is um, much more behind it than setting up a, a server in a way. I mean, uh, you know, this is in a way you did in, in the very directly when you had your talk at the Enquete Commission at the Bundestag in March 2020, if I wrote it down. So this was like right when the shit hit the fan, as you said. Um, so, and you talked about AI and ADM and the bias they could amplify. Um, did you have the feeling that, or do you know, to your knowledge, did it have any effects? Could, did you get a direct feedback while you were there? Or? So the uh, Enquete Commission is actually presenting their uh, output this Monday with a live stream um, where everyone can see what, what, they, what they discussed. Um, I, found it, I found it sad that so they would only live stream the uh, Enquete questioning, uh, the Enquete presentations, but not the questioning, like when um, members of parliament would ask you like further, further questions. And I was invited for the round where we were talking about women and AI, like super broad topic. I remember sitting in front of this topic being like, okay, where do I even start with my six minute input? And I was surrounded by, um, yeah, representatives of industry. So these commissions are still very much, um, there's not a lot of civil society organizations uh, involved as stakeholders. There's industry, then there's research, of course, when you talk about the topic of AI, and you oftentimes talk about it, oftentimes talk about it at a very kind of meta level. I remember for the uh, women and AI topic, the industry representatives would talk about all the the programs they had within their companies in order to promote women, which is an, in, an important part, I agree, but to just talk about this while there's all this complexity with bias and discrimination and a lot of intersectionalities beyond like just white women sitting around the table and advising the government, uh, government on how to do things better. Um, yeah, I was a bit, not upset, but like the, the reality, like I had expected different. Um. Diplomatically put. Well, uh, Jamil, I'm sorry we have to talk about Flusa during a drink later, I believe, um, because I think we should open to the audience if there are questions, comments, ideas, maybe for the next two days. Everybody's still in lockdown mode and not used to talk. Please, there's, there's one in the back. Hi, um, Jeremy, thank you for your comment about the 1% the being like the hackers uh, who are creating the technologies for a lot of people who are not in that 1%. And I, I think we're really in some very dangerous times that internet technology has taken many wrong turns and it's very hard to get back to where we could make these technologies um, positive for communities. And an example I have, I think, to go against the grain, we should be talking more about not becoming data cities or smart cities, but maybe something more like intelligent Keats communities, like we have this really nice word in Berlin about the neighborhoods. And maybe, it, um, this is kind of a question, do you think with good technologies, could we may, maybe possibly think in the direction of making our Keats communities incompatible to the big player games of scooping the data of an entire city. So we maybe need to think of not allowing all the traffic information from Beifalgé to be opened up, but we should be protecting that data so it cannot be used by big players. And so this, this idea of always going towards the openness now in the context that we're in, in a very, very dangerous predatory situation of huge players that we can't stop 
I mean, they, they have not, they're not being reined in. And so everything that we develop should be taken into consideration that the big players will take advantage of all the data that gets accumulated in any context. Uh, an average small citizen, small business owner is not going to really uh, take very much big advantage from scooping the entire Bayfelge traffic data. So I'm wondering, do we need to rearrange our thinking because of the dangerous context that we've landed in, where we, we really aren't being empowered anywhere near the way huge uh, Titan players are being empowered by data collection? Uh, thanks for bringing the perspective uh, up. It's um, uh, very actual. And by the way, my pessimism about policymakers is very much bound to the fact that I spent the last months in Italy reading Italian news. I make an example. In Italy, uh, the schools are reopening, have reopened, and um, Google uh, uh, school uh, platform, whatever it's called, is massively used. Basically, they are doing a huge data grab, and now back to the memory ownership or back to the techno images of, uh, of Flusser, how much can you um, generate out of knowing the process of learning of a person and how much can you generate also of profit by that uh, amount of information. And of course, of, of cornering that person in, uh, in one of the uh, few possibilities that the algorithm are giving that person. So, yeah, school, uh, I mean, disciplinary institutes have always been a nasty beast. So now we are just uh, uh, perhaps accelerating uh, uh, that process and putting a lot of uh, kids' knowledge in the hands of, uh, of a very accelerated and out of control by the very makers, I believe, system. And um, it's, it's an interesting point. Uh, we, we should see cities from the eyes of the kids as, uh, as um, some pragmatic, pragmatic anarchists have suggested in the past. Uh, I just don't get the name of one writer, British writer that uh, uh, wrote a book about the city scene from the eyes of the kids. It could be a good pattern actually of, of, uh, of design. And um, at last I hope that uh, here, speaking to the policymakers, uh, um, here the, the government will do a better job with defending actually schools in this very crisis, in this very kairos. I heard the German government has instantiated two billions for uh, digitizing uh, uh, the, the, the schools and, and putting uh, e-learning platforms and uh, digitizing in general the infrastructure. This could be a massive disaster, could be a grab by uh, some industrial players and multinational institutions that will just sell that data and, and, and make a market of it. Or it can be a great opportunity to actually empower the players that are on the ground and know how to use uh, free and open source tools that are already there to be used. And uh, yeah, my regret is just that when I speak to policymakers this way, they just look at uh, any player, any proposal, any community they have in front and they say, yeah, but we can't sign a contract with you like we do with uh, SAP, Google or Microsoft because, uh, you know, that's done, deal done then. Otherwise, we have to deal with a lot of complexities. And, uh, yeah, it may be complex, but... Uh, yeah, and there's always two sides to it, right? So, of course, the big players can monetize maybe on the transport data, but at the same time, they are promoting public transport and uh, giving access to a lot of people to this information on when the next bus um, is coming. And I think another question that is connected to that is how can cities access the data that uh, companies are producing about the city? So, for example, um, San Francisco, where Uber and Lyft are a main part of like um, a transportation, um, how can the city, in order to plan the city better, access this data and take this data into account when they're planning their policies? So, what is a not only like opening up data to the public, but then also thinking about like how can um, the public um, access important infrastructural data back from the big corporations? I'm not sure if we have time for another question. We're a bit over time. There is one. Is there one question? Please. My, my question is just like, 
is there like any kind of like research on rural life, rural. Uh, you know, smart rural life or how it could affect like, um, you know, people outside of cities? Should I? I believe that um, speaking about problems of the cities, uh, we should stick with the problem. Uh, I also believe that there is a tendency of people that can afford it nowadays to actually dream of a, of a, of a shed or a villa or, you know, it, it goes in ranges, it's the same thing, like if you want to be in a shed with a shotgun and three dogs or you want to be in a villa with a swimming pool, you're still dreaming of isolation. And uh, as, a, as a humanist that wants to progress uh, uh, humanism, I think we should, uh, we should look at the problem as itself because dense settlements are necessary, are, they can be fun and, um, and they can be necessary for, for further development of society. So, yeah, I'd rather stick with the problem of cities, but yeah, it's nice to be in the countryside. So, so I'm from the countryside in Austria and I mean you can already see the, the digital divides, right, when you look at the broadband access that people have. So there's a lot of like the lines that I was talking about earlier that, that um, the technology can draw. You, even when you look at the broadband map of Berlin, you can see a clear map, uh, you can see a clear line um, at, the, at the border and every time you take a train. So there's a lot of people, like there's this tendency of like leaving people behind because they're just not connected. So I think it will be more important than ever to also talk about um, urban infrastructure and what role does technology play there and, and what advances do we see there and, and can reproduce. So I, I don't think we should be focusing on cities alone, absolutely not. Montead, it kind of came from my personal life. I'm from the countryside in Hungary. <laughs> you know, like I was just like thinking like, you know, like uh, it, we know the effect that we, it has on the cities, but I know that like, for example, I we didn't have a phone till 97, like even like, you know, landline phone where I was from or uh, we had like broadband internet like three years later than other people. So I was like thinking, you know, a lot of people just are stuck in the country or like, you know, it's countryside or just end up living there for whatever reason. You know, it's also, I was just like, you know, throwing this idea around, but yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we have another question there, or maybe yeah. in two. We have we just, yes. Yeah. If it's possible, yeah. We want to give an opportunity to some of the people in the chat, and we do have one question um, for Julia. Thank you. It's regarding the sidewalk project and smart cities in general. And the question was regarding your view on these projects happening on a smaller scale. So, for instance, there are many cities in the world where there are smaller developments employing smart city technology. And doesn't this mean we'll end up living in sidewalk style cities? And if so, can we resist this? I don't, like, I hope we're not going to end up in these cities. Um, there's so many, just looking at the prototype fund um, or, or, or uh, Code for Germany, for example, there's so many great examples from um, developers, designers, civil society organizations when it comes to technology and how um, neighborhoods and people can benefit from new developments. Um, there is a pretty impressive project from Stuttgart, for example, where hundreds of people are measuring air quality data with small do-it-yourself devices because the city uh, itself is only measuring it at four central stations. So they were re really curious on how to um, how to gather more data and contribute to uh, public open data. So I think we should be focusing more of these gra more on these grassroots projects and seeing like um, the ideas that they are coming up with. Like how can be how can they be used and scaled up to a larger um, to a larger city or, or urban context and, and what does it need for these ideas to be scaled up? Does it need funding? Does it need better modes for participation for citizens? So I think by not only focusing on all the like technocratic um, city ideas that are out there but are also looking beyond them at like smaller, smaller examples that civil society organizations are coming up, I think that could be a solution to not get caught up in, in uh, dystopia and in technocentric uh, ideas around cities. Okay, I would like to address one last question. You were waiting for a while, I'm sorry that you wait. Can we have a microphone? Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much. My name is Thomas Kalunga from the Rock Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation. And um, I have a question in regard to data and who owns the data. So the first question that came before was um, centralizing the data. And I'm wondering if smart, can smart cities still serve the purpose we could like them to serve if the data was decentralized? That is the idea you want before letting the data producers become the owners of that data and decide what is to be done with that. And the second question is, how can we create smart cities and, to, uh, um, and, and still make sure there is equality? What you talked about, about um, um, stereotyping, biases, and we can experience this, for example, in the US, you talked about the software that was racially profiling people in the wrong way. So how can those particular social problems be solved and and towards them, and we have um, a software that is able to, or we have a smart city that is able to advance human living or human dignity at the same time. Yeah, I think a first step would, could be to not focus too much on the data city or the smart city, but to really ask, like, what do the cities look like that we want to see in the future? Like, what are our visions for them? And to not stop with the technical possibilities, what's possible today or what corporations are promoting to us, but to really just don't think about the technology when you're trying to, or, 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 or don't center around the technology when you're trying to envision a world that you would like to live in in the future. And what are values that are important for you? And these values you then have to take back to the technology and when you start building the tools, center and focus around them. So I think it's not a matter of asking like, what will the data city look like, but what will the city of the future in um, a green um, city with a lot of equality look like? Um, or whatever like people imagine this city or these futures to look like. So I think the starting point has to be a different one than the technology, if that answers the question. Yeah, about data, I have to add uh, um, a posture in designing any technology that deals with it and that allows decentralization and ownership of data has to include uh, principles of data minimization, which is often overlooked. Uh, you don't need to carry all the information that is in a data unit all the time. Actually, you should get rid of any information that is unuseful on a larger scale as soon as possible. So the principle is need to know, which is familiar in the intelligence community. It, you don't just say anything just because it's there. You throw it away. And this way we can have by design a pattern that is scalable and can anonymize and still make data useful because what is really useful is not the information about one person, is the information is the aggregated information and geospatialized uh, to certain places of the city. So data minimization against minim again uh, minimalism. Well, I think um, talking so much about the fundamentals today was in a way, both of you used the term fundamentals and I think it applied to both of your inputs. It's a good, great opening to open a wide field of our discussion in the next two days. So I would like to thank you for doing that and going as broad and as in depth as you did with your two presentations. Um, anything you want to add projecting to the next two days or shall we call it a session? I'm a big fan of uh, Disruption Network Lab and please keep it up uh, against all odds. I really appreciate that yeah, you keep yeah. it up. Yes. So I also wanted to thank you a lot for this uh, great keynote. I think it was a wonderful start of our conference. Um, so thank you, it was really great and inspiring and I want to tell to the whole audience to come back uh, at uh, uh, 6.50, so we have to have a break now and we really need all to leave the room because we need to have air uh, going through, uh, so please, uh, it's weird to say go out and come back and an important uh, aspect is that you uh, have a token that is uh, connected to your chair, 
So if you are coming back, that we hope you uh, do, you should keep the token. Otherwise, uh, if you leave, you have to give it back at the entrance because it means that then somebody else can get your chair. And please also remember that when you move around, you should use your mask. So see you at uh, 6.50 and the people of the next panel that will be about subverting tracking and surveillance, please come back in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.